this guy was as cold and calculated as they come, maybe we weren't going to get it solved. It was like the epitome of innocence that had been preyed upon. This is a case that has no evidence. We didn't have DNA. We didn't have fingerprints. Step inside the court of law with the new true crime podcast, American Justice. We realize we have four men who answered the same ad for a job on a farm. My brother Ralph went to interview and he was never seen again. A podcast that explores impactful crimes and reveals how our justice system works. You have to consider that there are more possibilities than one. And sometimes how it doesn't. We have to find whoever this monster is. Go in depth into chilling cases and their conclusions in this new true crime series. You just have a pit in your stomach thinking, how many people are we going to find? New episodes of American Justice are available every Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of The Prosecutors is brought to you by Huggies Little Movers. Get your baby's butt into Huggies Little Movers. We got you, baby. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on the Prosecutors. When Zona Hester was murdered, there are some who say she didn't stay silent. This is the story of her role in bringing her own killer to justice. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my spiritual co-host, Alice. Let's hope that doesn't mean any spirits want to come visit me, because I am not down for that. I know you want to go ghost hunting. That's the last thing I want to do. You know, Alice, as we learned when we talked to Ryan Bethay and The Exorcist Files, when you open yourself up to this kind of stuff, that's when the spirits come. So I think maybe just doing these podcasts... Could be enough. Are you to, trying uh, to get me to quit? Because I will. <laughs> <laughs> Which one do I love more? Not being visited by spirits or this podcast? Sorry, guys. <laughs> not mm. being visited by spirits. Mm. Well, <laughs> Alice, sometimes when spirits visit you, they can help bring justice if the situation is right. And okay. tonight, today, depending on when you're listening to us, tonight from when we're recording this in the depths of August... <laughs> Which just in the adds heat, like a whole in the heat level. of the dog days of summer. I just want y'all to know, just because you're listening to it in October and we recorded this in August, we are still fully in the Halloween spirit. We got music playing. It's dark <laughs> and spooky. Alice is scared. It's great. It's Always great. scared. There's a chill in the air. It's only like 95 degrees today. It's basically fall. So football just started. I mean, what more could you ask for, right? And today we have what is really sort of the ultimate combination of true crime and October spooky. The only case that I know of in recorded history where a ghost helped solve her own murder. This is the case of Zona Hester. And I cannot wait to share this one with you. You may know it as the story of the Greenbrier ghost. And look, you guys know I don't like spirits. I don't like scary stuff. But if we're going to have one, I am all for ghost justice. And this is. And here's the other thing. I think maybe I'm so scared because I fully buy into all of this. I absolutely believe the story you're about to hear happened. And I think the people who heard it also believe it. And there's a lot of, I would say, circumstantial evidence pointing to its validity. And let me just say. Before we dive in, if you're in Hollywood and you want to start a show called Ghost Justice, you have our permission. It would be amazing. (laughs) I will not be a part of that, but you are welcome to take the name. (laughs) So those of you who have not heard of this story, you are in for a treat. Elva Zona Hester, who went by Zona, 
fantastic name, anyone who's looking for a great name, was born and raised in the Richland section of Greenbrier County, West Virginia absolutely beautiful part of the country. It was a remote area with a small population and not many outsiders. But when Zona was just 22 years old, she met one of these outsiders. His name was Erasmus or Edward Trout Shoe. Trout. No, his name's not Trout. His name's Shoe. (laughs) <laughs> well, his name is Trout. And it let me is just Trout, say this. It's the middle name. I think it's a bad sign when someone's named after a fish. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to insult any people out there. Are you not from Alabama? I've met so many fish named people. Fish people? You have not what's, what's a fish named person? Like catfish? I mean, think about it. Catfish. There's an entire bad. law firm named Troutman Sanders. It's bad. <laughs> Troutman, I mean, that's the last name, number one. That's fair. Not a that, given that's name. That's fair. That's it's bad fair. to be catfish. It is bad to be catfish. You don't want that. Red herring is bad. That's like a lie. You don't want that. Sharks eat you. You know, you don't want to be named shark. I mean, this guy was named trout. I, I don't know. I just think it's a bad sign. I'm just taking it as a bad sign when, you, when you're named after Don't give fish. away the story yet. Don't give I'm away sorry. the story. So I mean, we're not trout covering trout it because shoe. everything ended happily. <laughs> it, it did not end great. But Erasmus is a great name. So Edward was what you'd expect. If he caught Zona's eye, it was because he was handsome, he was a blacksmith from a neighboring county, and he was generally well-liked in Greenbrier County. He was regarded as powerful, charismatic, and boastful. So it's not a shock that young Zona was absolutely smitten with him almost instantly. Yeah, and you know, Zona, Zona had sort of a difficult life even before this. She had fallen in love with a local guy and actually become pregnant with his child. Their families forbid them from getting married, and then she actually, the baby was stillborn. So she'd been through some tragedy, and apparently after that, after losing the child, that was the end of that relationship because... As, as we've talked about before, oftentimes when you do lose a child, it can really drive a wedge between two people. And she fell into a depression and was very sad for quite some time. And it was really the arrival of Edward. And he went by Edward, not Erasmus, for reasons that will become clear later on. But when he arrived, he really kind of brought her out of her shell and she would go out to do, you know, to do basic chores. And there's this new blacksmith in town. Obviously, blacksmith, very valuable position. His father had been a blacksmith. He had learned the trade. He'd come to town, and everybody liked him. And his his blacksmith shop sort of became a place where people would gather. He was sort of a notorious raconteur. He would tell these stories. He was very charming. People fell for him pretty quickly, and so did she. And it really brought her out of her shell. And it's just unfortunate that Edward was hiding a dark past. As Alice said, he was from a neighboring county. He didn't grow up in Greenbrier, West Virginia. Best Virginia, some would say. Some would just say Virginia, if you're a fan of the Constitution. But West Virginia. And where, by the way, Mothman. Mothman Festival will have happened by the time you heard this. We tried to go, didn't we, Alice? We sent him emails, said, hey. We're not cool enough for them. Not going like, Just never even responded. We, so, we heard the female podcast host really doesn't like Mothman. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So if you went to Mothman Festival and you wished we were there, we could have been there. But tell the organizers. Maybe next year. Anyways, I digress. Edward is hiding a dark past. He had been married for the first time in 1885. This was a long time ago, by the way. I don't know if we established that. We're going all the way back to the 1800s. Our story takes place in 1897. So... In 1885, he had been married for the first time, and obviously not to Zona. His first wife was named Allie Eastland Cutlip. They had a child together, a girl named Gerda, but the pair were far from happy. One night, Edward apparently beat his wife so badly that a group of vigilantes dragged him out of bed and threw him into the icy river, which tells you something, because this is the end of the 1800s, and... You know, there was sort of a prevailing view of you leave these. I'll say it. Men beat women, right? Yeah. Like, not that it's okay. Absolutely not okay. But in this time, you had to have beat your wife so badly that this clearly didn't happen in the midst of the fight, right? It wasn't in the midst of the fight and they broke it up. They went after him after he'd gone to bed. So he did not learn his lesson. After this, he essentially threw his wife and their infant daughter 
out of the house and told them to just leave, which they did. They went back to her parents' house, and he never had anything else to do with them. Subsequently, though, he would be arrested for stealing a horse, which is the kind of thing probably 30 years before this would have gotten him executed, but this horse thievery only led to him being put in prison. He actually ended up serving a few years in prison for stealing this horse. And while he was in prison, Allie took the opportunity to divorce him. And in her divorce papers basically said, he just completely abandoned us, left us with nothing. And, you know, once again, it's the late 1800s. Divorce is not exactly common. But when you abandon your wife and child, that's a good reason to get a divorce. And pretty much no matter what your views are on divorce. And he and she was able to get a divorce. And good for her because she was able to go on and live the rest of her life and that was not true of everyone who knew Edward. Absolutely. And this would not be Edward's last wife. Not long after, in June 1894, Edward got married again, and this time to a woman named Lucy Ann Tritt. But just eight months into marital bliss, or what seemed like marital bliss, Lucy died suddenly. And there was no investigation into what caused her death, but... You can imagine rumors swirled. Some speculated that she fell through the ice. Others said she was hit in the head with a brick. And some even said she was poisoned. The truth, at least as Edward told it, was that he'd been repairing a chimney after a particularly bad winter. And as he was replacing a broken brick, he tossed them down to the ground below. And unexpectedly, at just that moment, Lucy walked outside carrying some water for her dear husband. But instead of getting the water to Edward, the brick that he had just thrown to the ground struck her in the head and she died of the trauma. So you can imagine even his own story kind of begins to give some validity to some of these rumors. But the problem is there were no witnesses but Edward and Lucy, and obviously Lucy perished from that brick to the head. And the suspicious town folk were forced to believe Edward as there was no other evidence. But their growing whispers eventually forced him to leave the area and move to Greenbrier, and that's where he met Zona. But Zona didn't know any of this about his first wife, Allie, their daughter, Gerda, the vigilantes throwing him out of bed, the divorce, horse stealing, serving time in prison, second wife, Lucy, the mysterious circumstances of her death, these sorts of things. None of this reached her because... As I was reminded tonight by my six-year-old, Facebook didn't exist. He asked me what Facebook was tonight, and I was like, ah, how do I mm. describe this? Mm. Maybe next time I will describe it as a public forum in which to make others aware of information that may not otherwise be known. But without this sort of information, a new town really was a new start, right? When you run someone out of town, when you leave town, it really was to get a new start because oftentimes you could leave those rumors behind, and that's exactly what happened here. Zona didn't know any of this about Edward. All she knew was this strapping blacksmith from the neighboring town who was handsome and seemed to take a liking to her. And so she fell in love with Edward and they wed in the fall of 1897, just weeks after meeting each other. And three months later, Zona too would be found dead. Now, when Zona died, her death was quickly ruled as resulting from natural causes, despite being very young and very healthy, and no one questioned it. No one, that is, but Zona's mother. But how could she prove that her son-in-law was responsible for Zona's death? Because the only witness was dead, and dead men and women tell no tales, or do they? Yeah, I mean, this was a whirlwind romance. As we said earlier, Zona had fallen into a pretty deep depression, and it seemed like Edward brought her out of it. And when that initially happened, her family was really happy about it, as you can imagine. It was nice to see sort of the light come back into her eyes. Now, Zona came from a pretty big family, but she was the only daughter. And her mother, she was very close with her mother. They were very tight. And she was very excited about Edward, and she wanted her mother to meet him. And so the story goes that her mother goes down to the blacksmith shop. And for whatever reason, as soon as she met him, she hated him. She just, there was something about him. And she actually went back and forbid Zona from seeing him. Said, look, there's this guy's trouble. You don't need to be around him. And this actually, Edward really liked this. He got a kick out of the fact that the families, he was forbidden, right? And Zona, unfortunately, I think also kind of 
that was attractive to her as well. So they actually end up running away and getting married. It's sort of an elopement. And they come back and they're married and the families just have to deal with it. And it wasn't long until she ends up dead as well. And it's not surprising, given those factors, that her mother would be suspicious. But initially, it seemed like there was there was nothing they could do. So let's look in a little bit more detail about what happened the day Zona died. So as we said, we're going back to 1897, January of 1897, as a matter of fact, January 24th. Now, Edward, he had a, a habit. He would go off to his blacksmith shop. He'd work for a little while. Then he would come home. He would eat lunch. Then he'd go back to his blacksmith shop. And this is what he did pretty much every day. But on this day, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, or maybe they are, at some point he goes by his neighbor's house rather than going all the way home. And he asks the son of his neighbor, 11-year-old Andy Jones, to go check on Zona at the house and to see if she needed anything from the market. He said, I can't make it all the way back. I'm so busy today. I can't make it all the way home for lunch like I normally do. Can you find out if she needs anything? Come to the blacksmith shop. Let me know. I'll pick it up on the way home. And and this was not entirely unusual. Although it was unusual for him not to go home for lunch, it wasn't unusual for Andy to help out. This was something that Zona often had him do. She'd pay him a little bit of money. He would help with chores around the house. If she needed something, he would go out and get it for her. That day, however, Andy shows up to the house and it's eerily quiet. There's none of the noise of a home in action. And he feels weird about the whole thing, but he's like, you know what? I'm sure it's nothing. He's an 11 year old boy. He's walking up the steps. He notices some blood droplets on the steps. He thinks that's a little weird too, but doesn't think a lot of it. The door is slightly ajar. He pushes it open. And when he does, when he enters, this poor child, this poor 11-year-old, he finds Zona laying at the bottom of the stairs leading to the second floor of the home she and Edward shared. Yes, this is... The Staircase, part two, or the prequel, I guess. This is the prequel to The Staircase. So Zona is at the bottom of the stairs, and it's interesting how he finds her. He he apparently was terrified of what he saw, but he overcame that fear to go to her and see if he could help her. According to an article about this written by Matt Sonic, Zona's, quote, body was stretched out straight with her legs together. One arm was at her side and the other rested across her chest. Her head was tilted to one side. Now, Andy, you know, it's amazing the things you'll tell yourself when you're in this situation. Andy's a child. He immediately begins to rationalize. He thinks maybe Zona is simply asleep at the bottom of the stairs. Not a normal thing to do. But when she didn't respond to him calling her name and when he touched her and realized that she was cold, he knew the 22-year-old newlywed was, in fact, dead. Guys, we want to talk about a podcast that needs no introduction because it's one that we've appeared on several times and we love Silver Linings Handbook. We love Jason Blair. We love the work that he does. He is one of the best interviewers in the business. He has interviewed a lot of people from both the true crime space and really across the spectrum. And he always manages to get the very best points out of them. He talks about he wants to do a podcast with conversations that inspire, and that's what he does every single episode. I hope you guys will check it out. It is amazing. We love not only appearing on it, but we love listening to it, and you will too. Absolutely. You will get so much out of his very interesting conversations with interesting people. The areas he's focused on have included well-being, mental health, the long criminal justice system, true crime, religion, society, culture, people who are underrepresented in the mainstream media, such as racial minorities, indigenous people, and LGBT. BTQ people. In other words, there is something for everyone. And what we feel makes this podcast different is that it's truly not scripted. We can say that having appeared on it before, because Jason uses the same natural curiosity you have listening in your living room or around a campfire with a new and exciting person you have just met. Jason's a former journalist who worked at the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and other newspapers. And the podcast is one of several comebacks from a 2003 scandal that he was part of at the Times that led him to start working in mental health. And his 
vulnerability around this has been so refreshing that we can all learn from. So subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Forget everything you know about fasting. Prolon by El Nutra is the only patented fasting mimicking diet that combines the benefits of prolonged fasting with a science-backed nutrition plan so you can hit your health and weight loss goals without actually having to give up all food. Here's the thing. I know all the benefits that come with fasting, but I just love food and it's so hard for me to completely go without any food. That's why Prolon is so amazing. Prolon by El Nutra is a scientifically backed fasting mimicking diet designed to clean out the cobwebs on a cellular level. Just five days can make a meaningful difference in your overall health. Introducing Prolon, a revolutionary plant-based nutrition program that nourishes the body while making cells believe they're fasting. It's researched and developed for decades at the University of Southern California Longevity Institute and backed by leading U.S. medical centers. Prolong helps promote healthy blood sugar, support cardiovascular health, and reduce abdominal fat. But Prolon isn't a diet. It's a science. Science based on Nobel Prize-winning discoveries in medicine. And this all starts with Prolon's five-day program, snacks, soups, and beverages, all designed to keep your body in a fasting state. It's unlike anything you've ever experienced. We both did the five-day program and feel so much better. It's no wonder why thousands of doctors now recommend Prolon to support healthy blood sugar and cardiovascular health. Right now, Prolon is offering the prosecutor's listeners 15% off their five-day nutrition program. Go to prolonlife.com slash prosecutors. That's P-R-O-L-O-N life.com slash prosecutors for this special offer. That's prolonlife.com slash prosecutors. And so Andy, in an absolute frantic panic, runs back to the blacksmith shop where Edward was working to inform him of what he saw. And meanwhile, Andy's mother called the local doctor and coroner, Dr. George Knapp. It took the doctor over an hour to get to the shoe's home, which actually allowed Edward time to go home and carry Zona's body upstairs where he washed her and then dressed her in this high neck dress with very interesting a stiff collar and he also placed a scarf around her neck and a veil covering her face now you may think nothing of that you know perhaps overcome by grief wanted recognizing that there was no saving her wanted her to just be in a beautiful resting place Except when Dr. Knapp arrived, he began to examine Zona to try and figure out what had happened. And it was at this time that Edward started acting suspiciously. He had been distraught throughout the examination, which could be expected of, you know, this newlywed who finds his young wife dead at the bottom of the stairs. He's sobbing. He's cradling Zona's head. But when Dr. Knapp starts examining Zona's neck area. In that instant, Edward's complete demeanor changed. He suddenly becomes agitated. He stops crying. And Dr. Knapp just kind of chucks this up to grief. So he doesn't press the issue. And instead of insisting on examining Zona's neck, he just leaves. And he lists the cause of death as everlasting faint, which It is an everlasting thing, one in which one never wakes up from, but I hardly think that is the cause of death. People have speculated, if you go online and you look this up, about what exactly everlasting faint is. (laughs) Apparently, this was a fairly common finding at the time. It was basically when you died and they couldn't figure out why you died, but they assumed it was natural causes. They called it everlasting faint. A lot of people say it's like a heart attack. Heart attack is everlasting faint. Now, she's 22 years old. So I don't think she died of a heart attack, but that is sort of one of the things that people say for everlasting faint. The other is just that it was just, it was like unknown causes was everlasting faint. As Alice said, if you faint, you never wake up. This everlasting true. You faint. don't when you yeah. die. <laughs> there you go. It's the 1800s. It's the best we could do. And look, you might be thinking, man, Dr. Knapp, he's not giving it his all here. You think he'd be a little bit more solicitous of what exactly happened 
to Zona. But I think you got to remember it was just a different time. And her husband, he apparently played the part well. From the moment that he was told she was dead, he was hysterical. He was inconsolable. He was was howling and crying and everything else. And he he sort of presented it as no one can touch her. She's my wife. I don't want anyone to touch her. I want to take care of her. I want to make sure she's okay. That's why I washed her. That's why I dressed her in, in her finest. The scarf, he said, was her favorite scarf. And that she had told him that she wanted to be buried in that scarf. Now, look, they'd only been married for like a couple months. So they, they started the burial discussion quite earlier. I realize... In the late 1800s, a lot more could kill you. Maybe people didn't live quite as long as they do now, but I mean, I haven't planned for my own burial at this point, what I want to wear. But according to him, Zona was, I want this scarf. And so he was going to wrap that scarf around her, by goodness. And so that, you know, he's he does sort of a minimal job, and then he moves on with his business. Three days after her death, she's buried at the Soul Chapel Methodist cemetery. Now, in between her death and her burial, her husband essentially stood guard over her body. He would not allow anyone to get near it. At the time, it was customary to sort of sit up with the body overnight, sort of like a wake. Family members would all come. They would sit together. They would tell stories. They would eat. Just a celebration of the life and a way to mourn and a way to support the people who had just lost a loved one. He stayed up with her. Everyone else would sort of take turns sleeping. He never slept. He stayed up the entire time, and he would not let anyone near her, including her own mother. So there were people, though, who had viewed the body, and there was something about it they couldn't quite place, but that was strange. These people were no strangers to death, and they weren't exactly as squeamish about it as we are. I mean, they were more personal with dead bodies. There was no embalming. There was no funeral homes. There was none of that stuff, right? And so Zona's head seemed loose. It seemed like it wasn't sitting on her body the way you would expect it to. In fact, it was so loose that eventually there was a folded sheet and a pillow placed beneath it to keep it upright in the coffin and to keep her head from moving. And this was very unusual. It wasn't something that people were used to, and they couldn't really explain it. The day after her burial, some more information came in from her husband. Her husband told Dr. Knapp that, in fact, Zona had believed she was pregnant at the time, and he changed the cause of death to childbirth, despite the fact there was no evidence beyond her husband's word that she was even pregnant, and she certainly wasn't having any... There was no baby born. There was no childbirth. There was no evidence that she had died of childbirth. But once again, it's the late 1800s. Frankly, medicine hasn't advanced that far in women's health now. <laughs> so at the time, this doctor's just like, okay, well, maybe, you know, that uh, she probably just died from childbirth. I'm just going to put that down and go with it. And you can imagine why, right? Especially if you'll find out later that, you know, Edward is still young. He still has a whole string of maybe ladies ahead of him. One accidental death in your past from a wife, maybe. Maybe a brick really did fall on her head. When you start having, like, wives die around you, you can see how that, even when you move to a new town, could be a rumor that is hard to cut yourself from. And so if you can have a everlasting faint change to childbirth, people die from childbirth all the time, sadly. That is a very natural thing that you would expect to happen to a young, otherwise healthy person, what would cause their death. So you can already see things at play of why. Why would you want it to be changed to this? There's no investigation. No one's, the police aren't looking at it. So what's the big deal? I think it's because Edward has the long game in mind. Now, fast forward just a couple weeks because now we're into February of 1897. And remember, Zona's mother, Mary Jane Hester, just never liked Edward. And she had warned Zona about him. And after Zona's death, after her burial, she just could not shake the feeling that there was something more to this death. And she was very suspicious of Edward Shue. Now, she knew in her gut he had something to do with it, but you can't prosecute someone based on your gut. She had no evidence to open an investigation or even go to the police about it. And so instead, she prayed for weeks that Zona would somehow reveal the truth of what happened. Because remember, Zona is the only witness and the only one who actually knows what happened other than Edward. And Mary Jane's prayers 
were answered in the most unexpected of ways. While Mary Jane was sleeping one night, Zona's ghost appeared to her in a dream four nights in a row. Not one, not two, not three, but four. So if she somehow either forgot the dream or thought it was an accident, Zona was sure to show up four nights in a row to make sure her mother heard the message and knew this was no mere coincidence, no mere trick of the mind from grief, but it was in fact Zona coming to deliver a message to her mother. In this dream, Zona told her mother that Edward had indeed killed her in a rage when he returned from work and discovered that she had not prepared meat with his dinner that evening. And her ghost went on to say that Edward, who had been abusing her for the entirety of their brief three-month marriage, attacked her, much like he had done many times before, but this time it went too far and he broke her neck, killing her. And when her tale was done, the ghost of Zona turned around and walked away. But eerily, her head turned around too, a full 180 degrees facing the other direction. As she walked away, her eyes continued to stare at her mother, and her mother stared back at her daughter, who had answered the prayers that she had prayed so hard for weeks. That's pretty creepy. I got I mean, that's... I know, I'm the one telling the story, but I got all creeped out from it. Yeah, the whole... <laughs> I mean, the... I don't know if they've ever made a movie out of this, but the whole her turning Ugh. her head fully around to look at her Ugh. mother as she walked away. I mean, that is just that to is really intense. just to really make sure her mom knew what she was telling her. And you know, obviously, when we finish with this, we can talk a little bit about what her mom saw or didn't see, and whether or not this was actually a spirit. But after four nights of this, she was convinced. In the first night, like Alice said, maybe chalk that up to grief. One night after another, her daughter coming to her, telling her the same story, seeking justice. So the first thing she does is she tells her family. She says, hey, this is what's happening. Zona's brothers had always been very, very protective of her. She was the only girl in the family. They were very protective of her. They didn't trust Edward either. And whether it was just because they didn't like the man or because they truly believed what their mother was telling them, they believed her. They said they thought it happened. And you also have to remember, I think people were much more open to spirits visiting in this way at this time. This is the beginning of the height of spiritualism. This is really when spiritualism was coming along, when you're having things like seances, where people are trying to speak with the dead. Thomas Edison, most famous for inventing the light bulb, was also trying to invent essentially telephones that could speak to the dead. I mean, this was something people were really invested in and they believed in it. So it's not that surprising that her kids believed her and they encouraged her along with her husband. You need to go tell somebody who can do something about this. So the morning after this fourth visitation, she sort of works up the courage and she visits the prosecuting attorney, John Alfred Preston. And she tells him about her encounters with Zona's ghost now, Preston, he asks her a lot of questions. He doesn't just send her away. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, your grief is overwhelming you. He asks a lot of questions. He asks a lot of details because Zona had pointed out a few details. He'd said things about where blood could be found in the home. She said things about where the clothes that she was wearing during the time of the attack, which apparently had blood on them. One of the other details that Zona said is that while he was choking her, she started to bleed from her mouth because he essentially was crushing her trachea. She talked about where those clothes could be found, and, and she gives all these details. And whether Preston actually believed her or just thought, I've always had my own suspicions about this. It was a little unusual. He decided to go with it. Number one, he calls the doctor in, the one who has the cause of death, Dr. Knapp, and sort of gets the story from him. And Knapp says, look, it was weird. He explains the whole thing. It was very strange. Husband wouldn't really let me get near her. I, he was overcome with grief. I didn't want to interfere with that. I, I tried to do the best I could. But yeah, I put a cause of death down. But it's not like I really, I did not get to examine her. So I'm not sure of this. And frankly, I felt strange about it too. It felt a little weird to me the whole time. And he seemed to actually be pretty happy that the prosecutor was coming and asking him questions about it. So they decided to 
exhume Zona's body, which was not a common thing now, certainly not a common thing at the end of the 1890s. They get a court order, and they exhume her body. Now, Can I just say, this being all done based on, like, essentially a ghost story, right, by a grief-stricken mother is really incredible. I know this is more than 100 years ago, but like you said, we don't exhume bodies, you know, easily today. Certainly not back then, especially with not all the embalming. So you don't know what you're going to find. So this is actually extraordinary that they are doing this based on a ghost story. And I think what you touched upon is really important here. We've probably heard or watched ghost stories. When I think of a ghost appearing, I think of just something completely creepy, right? Like everything in the room turns cold and the ghost just says, he killed me and walked away. But it wasn't that. Like, I didn't know Zona when she was alive, but I like Zona because she knew what it took for a ghost story to be believed. And in the sense of all the details, it's like she was, she was an attorney before her day. She knew she needed evidence and not just a mere finger pointing so i just i don't know whenever you have girl power you just gotta like even in the dead you just gotta point to it and you know things come together here january 24th is when she died her body is exhumed in february and the good thing was remember there's no embalming but it was really cold (laughs) it was in the middle of the winter and so when they exhumed the body they found that actually her body was in perfect condition So they were able to do a full autopsy, and they actually had three physicians who performed that autopsy. They did check her stomach for poison, and they checked her other vital organs, but it didn't take very long at all for them to rule out poisoning and identify the cause of her death. In fact, there were finger marks on her neck indicating that she had been strangled. Her neck was broken between the first and second vertebrae the ligaments were torn and ruptured and her windpipe had been crushed this wasn't just a strangulation this was a violent attack i mean he had really gone after her to the point that one physician speculated that he might have stomped on her throat might have been one of the causes of of this death and remember he's a blacksmith he's a strong guy he has strong hands if he decided to go after her He was capable of doing a lot of damage. While they're doing this autopsy, they've actually called Edward. Edward opposed exhuming her body, obviously, and was very upset that this was going on. They had him right there while they were doing the autopsy. And according to an article in Wonderful West Virginia Magazine, which I'm sure is absolutely wonderful, at one point, one of the doctors comes out from the autopsy and says to Edward, Well, Shu, we have found your wife's neck to have been broken just as Zona's ghost had described. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Guys, October is the season for wearing masks and costumes, but some of us feel like we wear a mask and hide more often than we want to, whether it's at work, in social settings, around family. But here's the thing. Therapy can help you learn to accept all parts of yourself so you can take off the mask. Because masks should be for Halloween fun, not for our emotions. You know, the great thing about therapy is that you can use it when things are rough, but also when you think things are all good because we all benefit from positive coping skills and learning how to set boundaries, especially when life gets busy. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash prosecutors today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash prosecutors. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to us talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average. 
and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. This episode of The Prosecutors is brought to you by Huggies Little Movers. Huggies knows that babies come in all shapes and sizes, and their tushies do too. Huggies Little Movers with its curved and stretchy fit. Moms know that there's nothing worse than an ill-fitting diaper, especially for your active babies. I love Huggies because I can rely on them to keep my baby covered while she moves around. You guys have heard about my sweet little baby. She just turned one deep into mobility. I am so excited about Huggies Little Movers because she can roll around, jump around, climb, which is everything she's doing. And I know that she is covered and so am I in the cleanup. And we all want the very best for our babies, and that's Huggies. Huggies Little Movers are curved, so babies feel comfy no matter how much they're moving around. And they're moving around a lot. They also offer up to 12-hour protection against leaks, which is a game changer. Get your baby's butt into Huggies Little Movers. We got you, baby. Just in a moment to let that all soak in. So not only is her story, the ghost story, backed up, but way to go this town. They take action because on February 24th, 1897, just a couple days after this second autopsy is performed, Edward Shue was arrested and charged with Zona's murder. They did not dally. They went forward with it because it seemed very clear based on this autopsy and what all the damage she had to her neck that She did not die, in fact, from childbirth or everlasting faint. And justice is moving pretty swiftly here. On June 22nd, 1897, Shue's trial began. And the prosecution did bring up Shue's violent past, 404B, by the way, discussing at length his two previous marriages. He brought up the fact that Shue had brutally beaten his first wife throughout their marriage and his second wife died under mysterious circumstances only eight months into their marriage. And the prosecution also claimed that Edward bragged in prison about his plans to marry seven more women in his lifetime. That He wasn't done. He was just getting started. And maybe he was going to be a polygamist and have seven wives. But when I hear that, I tend to imagine that those would probably be consecutive wives because each would probably meet an untimely death like the past two wives. So the star witness for the prosecution was Mary Jane Hester, Zona's mother. Now, you might be expecting, this is late 1800s, they're going to go full on with this ghost story. But in fact, they don't. The prosecutor believed Mary Jane, but that wasn't going to be the focus of his case against Edward. In fact, he relied a lot on evidence, the kind of evidence we've talked about, the evidence of the autopsy, things he said, unusual things he did, his unusual behavior, his past violent acts. I mean, that sort of thing. And the things that he really questioned Mary Jane about were the relationship, the fact that she knew that Edward had been violent with her daughter, that, that sort of thing. He didn't really even get into the ghost story. Because he thought, look, who knows why she said that? Maybe she believes it. Maybe she really saw a ghost. Maybe she didn't. But if there's one thing I can be sure of, it's that the jury is probably not going to believe that. And they'll think she's incredible. And they'll focus on the ghost story. And they won't really focus on the evidence. So I'm going to leave that behind. But the defense attorney makes a decision. He decides, I am going to go after Mary Jane for those same reasons the prosecutor was worried about. Because if we can get her to talk about the ghost story, it's going to make her less credible. So he goes after Mary Jane about the ghost story. And it was, according to all accounts, a huge mistake for him to do that. She tells the story of Zana's ghost visiting four nights in a row. She never wavers, despite the defense attorney's best efforts to get her to change her story or to undermine her or to mock her or to make her make all this seem silly. 
And I think, you know, there's a couple of things I think are interesting. I can't help but think about this from an evidentiary point of view. As if the defense attorney had not done this and brought this in, I'm not even sure you could bring it in because uh, I assume a ghost statements outside of a court would be hearsay. I mean, it's not really a dying say. declaration. <laughs> It's a dead declaration. <laughs> it's a dead declaration. I mean, maybe it falls into the catch-all. You always wonder, what is the catch-all for? Because there's so many exceptions. There's a catch-all. For those of you who don't know, hearsay, you know, there's a rule that says you can't have out-of-court statements admitted for the truth of the matter asserted. That's the rule. And then there's like 87 exceptions to it. We went through them in the Legal Briefs episode, if you want to check that out. But then at the very end, after you've gone through like all these exceptions and it feels like you've covered every possible exception there could ever be, there's a catch-all exception, which is like, Anything else? It's kind of like those things that we haven't thought of. Maybe ghost testimony about their own death would fall under the catch-all. I mean, it's a possibility. That or dying declaration. Could it be an excited utterance if you're a ghost? But how excited would it be if it were four days in a row? You know, like you could really start to, to cross just really, this. Really excited, really excited for four about days, it. you know? Yeah. So excited. And, and it wouldn't be a dying declaration because it's like dead declaration, dead declaration, dead declaration, dead declaration. You know? Yeah, it's true. I'd say that's a catch all if there ever were one. I think it's a catch all. But I would just do the confronting the, you know, your constitutional right to confront your accuser. Right. But that's the thing. That's why the prosecution can't bring it in. But if the defense, if the defense waves that, if it wa- if waves the confrontation clause, waves the rules of evidence and starts bringing in hearsay, because he can bring in the hearsay to attack the credibility of the witness. And that's what he's doing. He's basically using what the ghost words to try and undermine the witness, but it allows a witness to tell the story. And she apparently tells it so well that everybody believes it. And it backfires on the defense, the community at large, the jury believed her testimony. Then the defense is put in a position where they have to take the ultimate gamble. They put Edward on the stand to testify in his own defense. And apparently he rambled on for an entire afternoon and made a very unfavorable impression on the jury. After eight days, the trial came to an end. There's a lot he has to face, right? There's not only this particular marriage, but the two marriages before. And I've told Brett my very sophisticated, and I I, I truly think juries actually go by this. We talk about this all the time, that the reason juries are black boxes is people make judgments on whether they like someone based on oftentimes intangibles that you may not even be able to describe. It might not be their specific words. It may be the way they carry themselves, how truthful they appear to you, and my own metric of how I approach everyone in my life. You're, you fall into one of two categories, everybody who I meet. <laughs> and you, usually when I, when I first put you into a category, you stay within that category. And I will not tell you which category you are. But when you meet me, I usually decide that you give me the heebie-jeebies or the warm fuzzies. There's no in between. And I truly think ju- juries do this. I, I say that jokingly, but not really. Because once you're faced with all of this evidence about his pretty abusive past with the first wife – curious circumstances of the second wife and then this third one okay ghost story aside all of the physical evidence matches the ghost story that's the thing this is why i don't think it was a great defense tactic is if they exhumed her body and then they found nothing they didn't find blood they didn't find broken ligaments and you know necks then yeah it is just a ghost story but we've talked about how leads don't really matter if if you get an anonymous phone call and it ends up being a credible tip and it leads you to you know, further investigative tools that give you evidence of the crime, fair game. It's totally fine. That's kind of what this ghost story is. It's an anonymous tip. Could have just been someone calling in our today terms. And so he has a tall order to fill. And it's not surprising that the jury just didn't like him on the stand. So on July 1st, 1897, after deliberating for only an hour and 10 minutes, which is a relatively short time when this trial has gone on for more than a week, the jury found Edward Shu guilty of the murder of his wife, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Zona Shu, aka the Greenbrier ghost, had put her murderer behind bars. And if you believe everything that happened... It truly was her appearing to her mother that set in motion the next steps that would ultimately lead to the conviction of her murderer. And had it not been for her, I don't know that they'd be able to exhume her body or that anyone else would have looked. So this is truly a ghost story that 
propelled forward the prosecution and conviction of her murderer. March 1900, just oh, about three years later, Edward Shu died after an epidemic swept through the prison. So though he did get a life sentence, he only served about three years of it. Yeah, and there were some people in town who wanted justice to be even more swift when he was only sentenced to life in prison, a lynch mob formed. And they were going to go break in and hang him, go ahead and kill him. But eventually the sheriff was able to persuade them, not that he needed to live, but that if they did that, some of them might get hurt and that would be a tragedy. So let's just let him die in prison. And in fact, he didn't live long. And hopefully the epidemic he caught was very painful and slow and and he experienced all the pain that he had forced on others, including Zona. So that's the end of the story, but it's not the end of the questions. And I think the biggest question, the most obvious question, is what exactly happened here? Now, number one, if you're worried about sort of the injustice of being prosecuted using you know, spectral evidence, ghost stories, like we're, it's the Salem witch trials all over again, right? All we need is somebody seeing Goody in the, in the woods with a black goat, and we'd have that. The jury said, look, Mama was really impressive, but that's not why we convicted the guy. If you looked at the evidence, there was a ton of evidence that he did this. His behavior, the medical evidence, the fact that she had clearly, she had been strangled to death and her neck broken. Remember, she's found at the bottom of the stairs. Now, you might think, well, maybe she fell down the stairs. The problem was, unlike in the other staircase case, the evidence here was so obvious that she had been manually strangled. The fingerprints on her neck were said to perfectly match the fingers, the size of the fingers that were on her neck perfectly matched his. The fact that her neck wasn't just broken, it was crushed. His behavior afterwards, bathing the body, changing her clothes. They never did find her clothes. Even though she gave sort of a general area of where he destroyed them, they were never able to find them. But they did never locate them, so... The statement attributed to the ghost that he had hidden the clothes, the clothes were never found. All of those things, his prior violence, those are the reasons they convicted, not because of the ghost. And that's great. But did the ghost show up or not? <laughs> that's the question, the ultimate question. Now, I don't know which way you're going to fall on this, those of you listening, or Alice. There are many people who believe to this day that Zona did come to her mother in her dreams and effectively solved her own case and, and testified, really, through her mother. Her words ended up in a trial transcript. But there are others who think a couple things could be happening here. One, maybe this was just a strategic lie. This was something that Mary Jane came up with to try and encourage the exhumation of her daughter's body. Maybe. I don't know that that would be the way I would go. Like if I was trying to get my daughter's body exhumed, I don't know that telling a prosecutor a ghost showed up in my dreams and told me that, she had been murdered, would be the way that I would proceed. Perhaps a more effective lie would be that she's close to her daughter, and for three months, her daughter confided in her that he was abusive, right? Because we know that he was actually, based on this ghost story, that he was actually abusive for three months, and this didn't come out of the blue. So I would think it would be a more effective lie to be like, he constantly choked her. This time, it may have just gone too far. She would tell me, but I told her, happy, you know, just happy marriage. Just, you should have cooked meat. You should have done whatever. But that would have been a more effective lie, just being like, she's been scared for her life before, and he's choked her before. We never got to look at her neck. Why is that? I would think that's more effective. Now, the other possibility is that this is a manifestation of her own beliefs, that she believes that Edward did something to her daughter, in the stress and the grief and the strain and the prayers to heaven manifested in her mind as a hallucination. And that in that hallucination, her daughter told her what she already believed. A couple things that are interesting about that. Apparently, the first time it happened, she thought it was a hallucination. She said to herself, that I, she said exactly that, like, I am stressed out in grief and I'm seeing my daughter and this was a hallucination. It was only after it happened day after day after day that she eventually changed her mind. But one thing, one thing about it, you can say, and I think some people who were, who were skeptics would probably say her story, the one that she told at trial, the one that's become famous, the one that includes her daughter's head turning 180 degrees and looking at her, that was probably something that she 
embellished after she learned about the autopsy report, after she learned that, in fact, her daughter's neck had been broken, and, in fact, had been broken at the first and second vertebrae, which is apparently what she said her daughter told her, that he had broken her neck at the very top of her neck. Well, the problem with that, and the prosecution anticipated that, after she testified and after the defense raised the issue of her story, the prosecution then called a number of people, of neighbors, who she had also told the story to of seeing her daughter. Neighbors who she had told before the exhumation that her daughter had told her her neck had been. So whether she just inherently knew it because of how he was behaving or whether her daughter actually said it, she knew that when they exhumed her daughter, they were going to find that her neck had been broken. And in fact, that is exactly what they failed. I believe the ghost story. That's just I'm me. Going right? I'm, I'm going I with the ghost story. I believe the ghost story. I just feel like it wasn't, even back then, ghost stories is not what convicts people. It's not like she could point to another. I don't think we can point to another case where a, a ghost story is like the genesis of the criminal investigation. You get a court order for the exhumation. So if this was her mother's attempt to get justice for her daughter even if she knew what happened i'm not sure that would be the lie to go with because she had no predecessors to point to to say this is the path to justice so it was a real gamble if not true yeah i mean it really was i believe that her mother absolutely believed it i don't think she made it up i think that she did not make this up whether it was a creation of her mind or an actual ghost is something that's hard to say she certainly knew things she certainly knew things that had happened to her daughter. She knew about the blood. She knew about the neck being broken. Now, maybe she had heard from the little boy who found her daughter about seeing the blood on the stairs or on the, the steps leading up to the house. And maybe just because of the unusual nature of her body before the burial, she'd sort of put two and two together, even if it was subconscious. I mean, maybe her subconscious mind had concluded that her daughter's neck had been broken. But what we can say for certain is that was accurate. So I choose to think that Zona solved her own murder as well. You guys can believe whatever you want, obviously. But I'm going with that, Alice. I'm with you. This is a case where a ghost solved a murder. Okay. Well, we do want to hear what you guys think about this story, whether or not you believe that a ghost solved the murder or whether or not you think this is just either mom lying or some sort of deep psychological issue shoot us an email prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod for all your social media thank you to everyone joining us very early in ad free tonight as we record this just think you could be having october and august if only you were a patron so join our patreon and frankly as you're listening to this we're probably recording christmas episodes or something i mean there's no telling so <laughs> and you can take part in the conversation as we go, and thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Alice, do you want to answer a question? Yes, because I'm not going to be able to go to sleep ever again now for fear well, of a ghost coming to me. We have one of the weirdest questions I've seen. So given that this is a weird ghost story, a weird story in the classic sense of weird, I'll read you this one. Okay, so this is from Stephanie. Stephanie says, When I was a kid... I thought that the bubbles and melted ice cream were George Washington's eyes. I have no idea why I thought that, but it freaked me out. What's the strangest... <laughs> I love it, Stephanie. This is great. <laughs> What's the strangest thing you incorrectly believed to be true when you were a kid? I can't top that. I can't top <laughs> George Washington's eyes, but that's a very effective way to get me to not eat ice cream. <laughs> yeah. I have one, though, now that I think about it. Do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, you, you I, go first. I feel like Maybe I it'll jog my memory. <laughs> until Stephanie said this, and, and then I, I suddenly remembered it. And I don't know why I thought this. I don't know if maybe I went through some time slips or something. But when I was a kid, when I was very young, I really believed that I could go back in time. So, <laughs> and the reason, and it's funny, man, it's just like all rushing back. Now that I'm thinking about Stephanie's question. So there was this time where I thought that I had pulled the curtains down. So I'd pulled the curtains down and the rod came down and everything else. And I was going to get in a lot of trouble. And I knew I was going to get in a lot of trouble. And I was really upset about it. And so I went to my room and I laid down in my bed and I just, 
I don't know if you could call it praying or just hoping that I could go back to before I did that and it not have happened. And I fell asleep in this in this like state of intense desire for this to happen. And when I woke up, the curtains had not been pulled down. And it was before when that happened. And so that happened. And so from that point forward, I believed that I could do that when I needed to. And then subsequently, something happened and I tried to do it and it didn't work. And so then I was like, well, what happened before? Did I actually go back in time? Or did I dream that I pulled the curtains down and all that happened in a dream? And then when I woke up, the curtains weren't pulled down And I just thought I went back in time. So I don't know if I actually went back in time or if I just thought I did. But that's Or a third possibility now that we're parents, which is that it probably was not as big of a deal. And like your parents walked in and were like, dang it, the curtains fell down and put them back up by the time you woke up. Yeah. (laughs) I I don't know, but I'm really I'm really happy for little Brett (laughs) that you that that did not, you know, end up being a, a traumatic moment. That's a good one. Stephanie, that's a great question. I I have nothing because I have nothing that I think I can think of right now, except my mom told me lots of things. So I know the genesis of (laughs) of the weird ideas where they're completely not true. And it took me a very long time to figure out that they were not true. Like to get me to eat fish as a kid, like salmon specifically, my mom said that unless I ate enough fish, I wouldn't know how to swim. Like, it didn't matter how much I practiced, unless I ate salmon or other fish, I would not be able to swim. And so I was like, I like distinctly remember when I realized this was objectively not true. I was in college and it was like going through the cafeteria line and everyone was getting like chicken tenders and burgers. And I was like, I'll have the baked fish, which is like not as delicious. And I remember like my friend looked at me and was like, you're going for the fish? And I was like, well, I want to be able to swim. And I was like, it's not true. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> like as I said those words, because at Washington and Lee, where I went to college, everyone had to pass a swim test before you could graduate. It was because tragically a kid had died drowning many, many decades ago. And the, the family had donated like a huge endowment. But the one requirement was that every student had to know how to swim by the time he graduated. So everyone who went to WNL had to take a swim test. And so it was like, I was like, oh, I have to be able to swim. So I was like, I'm going to eat the fish because I'm going to, I want to, you know, pass the swim test. And I was like, okay, cool. No one repeat what I just said, because I now know it's false. <laughs> yeah. Now be yeah. careful what you tell your kids. <laughs> Yeah, it is funny the things that you you just always believed and and then all of a sudden you're like, huh, that wasn't true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. That was actually a really good question. That was well, a good I'm, question. Because you know why it's a good question? I know that we're going to get flooded with people saying their weird conceptions yeah. about reality. And that is a great Halloween question because we do think of weird things all the time. To this day, I get a little confused like whether dragons or unicorns or narwhals are real. I know one of those Narwhals three are. are definitely real. I know, yeah. I know. But like, why an narwhal but on a unicorn, you know? So anyways. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's that's it's, a great one. I bet if we sat here, we could come up with some more things. So yeah, that's your challenge, everybody out there. Let us know what unusual things you believed as a child or into college that at some point you realized wasn't true. Okay. Well, this has been fun. That was a great question. Leave a five-star review on Apple. And if you leave a question, we'll answer it. That one, actually, she left somewhere else and emailed it to us. That works as well. If you don't have Apple or you don't use Apple and you want to leave a review somewhere else, you can do that. If you guys are watching movies this Halloween season and you're looking for one that has ghosts, I'm going to recommend The Others to go along with our story today. Set in sort of a period not unlike the one that we talked about today, and also, in a way, involving a ghost solving a crime. So, check that out. Great movie. Nicole Kidman. Fantastic. Don't Google it first. Just watch it. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent movie. Okay, Alice, do you have anything else you want to mention before we sign off? No, but this one did creep me out. This one really, I don't think this opens you up. If you listen to this, you're the 20% who don't want to open yourself up to spiritual things. I don't think this does because I don't think Mary Jane Hester asked for those dreams and the beyond can come talk to you. Well, if that's this what I'm telling myself tonight. Don't please, please don't tell me otherwise. <laughs> Just wait till next week because next week going to creep you out 
a lot more than this week. <laughs> so we'll be back next week for that. Also, we'll be true crime, I promise you. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. But this this type of ghost story I can get behind. Yeah. This is like Justice Ghost. Justice Ghost. <laughs> Justice yeah. Ghost. Justice Ghost. Uh, how was y'all's weekend? Television show. That Justice would ghost. not American Justice, but Ghost Justice. Ghost Justice. Justice Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I traveled this weekend, or I actually was supposed to be gone for one night, and then. And then got stuck in Texas. I mean, not the worst place to get stuck. That's great. There's worse places. Going to the Green Briar as like a college student for like, mm-hmm. you know, a Sigma Chi prom or whatever was like the fanciest experience I've ever had. I was like, they just have tea every day. People drink <gasps> tea for fun. <laughs> did you go on the uh, the bunker tour while you were there? I did not. No. I always want to do that. TV is a place for movie fans like me and TV fans like me. They've got something for everyone and it's free. I love free and I love Jersey Shore. For me, it's The Godfather. SpongeBob SquarePants. I am Patrick. Patrick is me. Oh, Forrest Gump, come on. Criminal Minds, solving crime after bedtime. Whatever you love to watch, Pluto TV makes it easy with thousands of free movies and shows. Pluto TV, stream now, pay never. 